Dakia B. How me Dakia B. Daya Yahi, Lay Ampetuki, Lila Wash, then Wachi and Capolo, Washichi, James Rowling, if you match up in a hey supper key, Yanko Chanku, Hemataha. You have chanted up at you, Welcome to uh, the ESA Tech Webinar Series. My name is James Rowlingly. I serve as chair of the tech section. And again, I welcome you um, from my heart with a handshake. I come to you from the, the sacred homelands of the Lakota people in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So we want to welcome you uh, to this webinar series. And I'm glad that you're here with us. Um, Jonathan, with the slide, please. In my introduction, again, I want to um, I want to um, say this to the our audience here, um, uh, ESA audience, that um, I want to say, Tanka Thank you all very much for what we call Tech Day at ESA at the conference. You know, we had a land acknowledgement really for the first time from the Tongva tribe. We're so grateful to them. You probably saw the video, it was, it was tremendous. We had a symposium, we had a sense of place um, activity, and we had a workshop. And also, we had a social networking event. It was great to um, for ESA to support this and to really to move in a really good direction, I think, in terms of how we work with TEK and our indigenous people from around the world. And finally, I want to say Wopilatanka to my tech section leadership team. So there's real people behind us, though you may see me. Uh, we have a tremendous leadership team. I just want to say their names today, acknowledge them. We've got Gwen Bridge, Alan Simmons, Bob Newman, Joseph Gazing Wolf, Lloyd Dean Hill, Frank Lake, Sally Ann Sims, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Teresa Marad, who works with ESA staff. So thank you all for a great day, and hopefully that will get good feedback from you in the audience and from the organization so that we can build and practice and get ready for Montreal in 2022. So with that, I want to um, introduce my good friend, Steve Vendoroy, uh, who's our uh, webinar speaker today. Steve is director and co-owner of the Firelight Group. Steve is an award-winning Anishinaabe professional and entrepreneur with a strong background in mapping and geographic information sciences business development, natural resource management, and project management. Steve founded the Indigenous Mapping Workshop, which you can find at uh, www.indigenousmaps.com with technology partnerships, including Google, ESRI, Mapbox, and NASA. He also applies his expertise to lead indigenous knowledge and land use studies for numerous indigenous communities affected by large scale energy development. Steve mentors indigenous practitioners, conducts risk assessments, builds decision support systems and monitoring tools, supports land claims and develops best practices, establishes consultation processes, facilitates community engagement and planning approaches that supports the negotiations between indigenous communities. Steve is an international speaker and presents at numerous conferences, university lectures and events. So it's my great pleasure and honor to, to, be, uh, to be here with you, Steve, and we welcome you to a webinar series and uh, take it away, my friend. Okay, uh, bonjour, uh, Blue Water Drum Man and Dishnikaz, Steve and Dishnikaz, uh, Ebb and Flow First Nation and Dunjaba. Uh, my name's uh, Steve DeRoy. Uh, I'm uh, Anishinaabe. It's, uh, it's nice to see so many people here. I have a lot of content that I'm going to be sharing today. So uh, we're gonna, I, I say buckle up. And, uh, and, and what we can do is I'll present uh, the materials that I have today and then um, we can have a, maybe a conversation uh, at the end. I'll try and save about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for uh, presentation uh, and question, uh, questions of the presentation. So, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, integrating Western science into indigenous knowledge processes. Oftentimes it's always framed the other way around where it's trying to integrate uh, indigenous knowledge into Western science. And I just thought I'd put that on its head and spin it around and see where it lands. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, today uh, I'm going to be talking, I'll give a, a bit of a brief introduction. Uh, I'll, I'm, gonna give, I'm gonna set the stage. We'll talk about indigenous peoples in the Canadian context. Uh, my background as a cartographer, I'm gonna be talking about the power of maps and how mapping plays an integral role in braiding these two different kind of worldviews of Western science and, and traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge. And um, so I will talk about uh, engagement principles with indigenous peoples, what works, some good practices. Uh, I'll go into a little bit about what is indigenous knowledge and I'll, I'm, I'm going to share some examples of where we've done some good work of braiding that indigenous knowledge in Western science. And at the end, I'll share some final thoughts and then we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, 
so Bojo, uh, James did a fantastic introduction. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, James. Uh, so Firelight is an Indigenous owned company, uh, one that I own. Uh, and uh, we work for Indigenous communities across Turtle Island. Uh, and we equip staff with the tools to be able to take this work on into the future. So a lot of our work is around capacity building and supporting community uh, desires and uh, aspirations. We work in a number of realms. Uh, we have a number of business areas. So traditional use study or traditional ecological knowledge is a, a big business area that says a lot. Of, we do a lot of work in that area. Mapping is a big uh, uh, support service for not only the TUS, but also all of our other business areas. Uh, we work in ecology, planning. Uh, a big part of uh, the work we do is an impact assessment and looking at large scale energy and the impacts on local communities. Uh, we work in, uh, in impact and benefit agreement negotiation support. We work in health and socioeconomic services. Um, since we started uh, uh, Firelight in 2010, uh, we've done over 250 community-led studies across the country. Uh, and uh, I really think this, uh, this uh, I mean, this is a true statement in that Firelight is a leader in Indigenous-led studies. And we work uh, uh, on behalf of communities that um, are really driving the process with some support from us. Um, I'll talk about Indigenous peoples. I, 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 before we talk about Indigenous knowledge and before we talk about these really great projects, it's really under, important to understand the history of, uh, of colonization and the impact on Indigenous peoples. Uh, this map really shows kind of the relationship between the British uh, Crown and Indigenous peoples through the uh, negotiation of uh, treaties. And these treaties were really about, uh, about peace and um, and uh, coexistence, and so uh, this this kind of uh, is an interesting map to me. This is a, this is actually a very, fairly current map from uh, the Department of uh, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, but I, I like how they frame it because they they talk about how it's historical treaties of Canada, um, whereas for me uh, my my perception of treaty is, is that it's still very relevant in our everyday lives. It's not a historic thing. I'm not a I'm not a relic of the past. Uh, and so it's just amazing how the government frames it as something of, of, of our past history, um, but for Indigenous peoples, it's their current reality. Uh, indigenous peoples in Canada, after the treaty making process uh, um, occurred, uh, the government established the Indian Act in 1876. And, and basically what this act was about was controlling every aspect of Indigenous people's lives. Uh, this picture on the top right is, is of a, of a uh, it, they called it the past system. So uh, it restricted First Nations people from leaving their reserve. They, first of all, First Nations were forced to live on these small parcels of land. And then they were able to actually leave that unless they got permission from the deputy, uh, uh, um, from the Indian agent in this case. And so uh, if you've ever heard of the term, a person's gone off the reservation, for us, that's a real reality because we actually couldn't leave the reserve, and uh, and you if you if you did leave the reserve, you could have been, and you didn't have one of these passes, you could have been thrown in jail, uh, or you could have been fined, uh, or or some other uh, uh, measure. We couldn't actually purchase ammunition. Our lands could be taken away for agriculture, roads, railways, or any other public works. Uh, the res our reserves could be moved from one municipality to another. Uh, if you were a First Nation woman who married a non-First Nation man, you'd lose, they would lose their status, uh, their treaty benefits, their health benefits, and the right to live on their reserve and be buried there. Uh, it prohibited First Nations from acquiring legal support, and it actually, if you were a lawyer, you couldn't, uh, couldn't actually work for First Nations unless you had a special license from the Superintendent General. Uh, and among other things, it prohibited uh, First Nations from speaking their language, practicing their culture, wearing regalia, and, uh, and ceremonies were declared uh, illegal. Um, so this, this, fact of, this fact of how the Indian Act has, has played in our lives it permeates to this day. And, and some of these things are no longer in the Indian Act um, from the original Indian Act in 1876, but uh, you can see that it has had multiple generational effects on our people. Today, this is where indigenous peoples are situated across the country. Uh, and you can see we're from coast to coast to coast. In fact, 
this map, this little pullout map was an interesting project. I was working with Google on, uh, on getting indigenous lands represented onto their base map. And so that was really an important uh, um, piece for us as we tried to uh, ensure that indigenous peoples are represented in everyday lives. So maps for me, maps for me are, are my life, but they are just one tool in a toolbox. And uh, I often ask people when I start mapping workshops, I say, well, what do you think? Do you think the lines on the maps matter? And most people, you get a mixed bag of responses, but the reality is, is that uh, uh, they do uh, matter. And those lines define our identity uh, and uh, they play a role in how we think about economy and they uh, affect uh, transnational uh, trades. And uh, as an Indigenous person, we used to just go wherever we needed to go, wherever the resources were and wherever our families were, we would just go and these boundaries didn't matter to us. Um, but uh, over the years, those lines have had a major impact on Indigenous people. And so now um, we've had to go to court to defend our rights, to talk about why our Aboriginal and treaty rights uh, are important. And it's changed the, the way governments interact with us and accommodate our interests as we move forward. So the work that we do is, is we take a rights-based approach. Um, so in 1982, so think about Canada. Canada is actually quite a young country. We only got our constitution in 1982. Uh, and, uh, and ensuring that indigenous peoples were actually reflected in the constitution was a big challenge uh, because before we were under the British North American Act, um, under section 90 and 91, there was uh, uh, a role and responsibility for, um, for the provinces and the, the federal governments to uh, manage those lands and resources. And we weren't even reflected in those acts. So getting First Nations actually reflected in the constitution was a, a major win for us because it actually meant that we had uh, uh, inherent rights and it meant that we had um, cultural, social, political, and economic rights. We had the rights to land and we had the rights to logging and fishing and hunting and our, practicing our culture and enforcing those treaties. And so um, everything that we do today and the work that we do is, is take, it's framed within that rights-based approach. And so over, over time, we've had some very major, major case law that has affected the uh, indigenous crown relations. So there was a case uh, called the Sparrow versus BC and whether or not government infringement on Aboriginal rights is justifiable. They call this the Sparrow test. Um, there was the Delgama case which in which that oral history could actually be uh, submitted and, and um, accepted uh, uh, equivalent to that of written testimonies. Uh, the Haida Nation was an important one that the Crown has a duty to consult with Aboriginal groups prior to exploiting land. Uh, the mixed to Cree First Nation, they signed Treaty Number Eight, uh, and uh, the Crown thought, "Oh well, we dealt, dealt with the land question. We don't need to talk to you." Um, but they challenged the uh, Crown and actually won at the Supreme Court that they that the, the Crown, in this case the government, has a duty to consult First Nations with treaty. Uh, and and uh, more recently, there was the Williams case that really um, pushed um, that the the First Nations were pushing not just for the rights to be able to be accepted, but that title be clarified, that they have title to that part of the land, that they never gave it up and they were able to document that. Um, and more recently, the one that I didn't include in here was one uh, was the Blueberry River First Nation, the Yahe versus BC, and that talks about cumulative impacts and the, and the and at what point does the government have a responsibility to reduce those impacts from made large scale energy developments on Indigenous communities. So you can see these cases we've had to go to court to prove our rights. I, I'm not a lawyer. Just to clarify, I'm not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice. I'm just raising these as examples of of important court cases that have affirmed our rights as Indigenous people. The duty to consult has been a, a, a major outcome of all of those cases in that you get these large scale energy developments and they uh, now have to uh, take into consideration how those projects will have an impact on local Indigenous communities. So for us, it's, it's about uh, proving our use and occupancy of the land. It's about clearly assessing the uh, social economic conditions. It's, it's presenting that solid evidence of impacts on our rights. And so uh, this raises the question of how much uh, consultation is required for, on any one project. So we talk about a weak claim at the low end of the spectrum, 
uh, a strong claim at the middle end of the uh, uh, consultation spectrum and at the deep end of consultation, proven rights, uh, proven rights and any impact, and, and we're looking at consent. And so somewhere along the line, when governments are making their decisions on how to engage with Indigenous peoples, it falls within the spectrum uh, and they'll, they'll take um, appropriate steps that they think is required. And so for us, uh, as Indigenous peoples, it's, it's always about understanding our, our own backyard and being able to say, actually, this is going to have an impact and, and pushing for that deeper consultation. Uh, in the Williams case, Chief, uh, G Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin stated that occupation must be sufficient, continuous, and exclusive. And so there's a number of test research process, uh, projects or products that come out of that uh, to achieve the test. And, and it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis when you think about this. And I'll, I'll go into more detail about what those research products are. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk about maps because that mapping is really uh, important to me, and uh, and I really believe that maps have had a, a critical impact on uh, our ability to be represented in space and place. And uh, so, just to give you some examples, uh, on the map on the left, uh, there uh, is a map of New France, and uh, this is a map that Fran uh, obviously there were explorers that came here, and they. Uh, they produced a map and you can see that there's a complete erasure of Indigenous people's perspectives. It makes it look like the landscape is empty and at the stroke of a pen we've ultimately been removed from the, that uh, 1685 map, which really uh, opened the door for that, man uh, for that ability to, um, to, for colonizers to come in and say, well, there's no one here, we can, we can exploit these, uh, these lands. Um, had they actually taken into account uh, First Nations, you'd actually know that there were First Nations all along those waterways and uh, the shores and, and throughout uh, those areas uh, that are reflected on the map on the right. So maps have been used uh, to assert power over territory. And this is an example of a map uh, from 1763. Uh, and it shows some indigenous groups, uh, but slowly the names and places are being replaced by uh, colonized place names. Uh, and in writing, uh, we actually uh, were ultimately uh, uh, removed. And this is this, these are some examples of, of how they described us. So uh, this is one way to uh, uh, demonize or diminish our, our, our longstanding tradition and knowledge uh, of place, space and place. Uh, and so this this map is actually a map, a picture I took uh, of uh, of uh, Treaty Number One and Two. I was in the archives, and um, you can see um, that most of those Indigenous place names aren't even reflected on those maps when those treaty negotiations took place in 1871. Um, okay, so what does that mean, and how do we engage with Indigenous people before we even start talking about Indigenous knowledge? What are some principles? Uh, and practices for engaging with Indigenous peoples. Well, one, community engagement principles are designing collaboration, they're participatory, they're inclusive, uh, they're transparent, they're innovative, they're flexible, and it's really important that you meet communities where they're at. And there's this, again, I love these spectrum. So the spectrum of public participation, this comes from uh, uh, the International Association of uh, Public Participation. And, uh, and so at the, at the left side, uh, it's more about informing and saying, well, we'll keep you, uh, we'll send you some information about, uh, about our, our, the work that we're doing or the project that we're doing to the deep end where we're actually the, we're placing the final decision-making in the hands of, of uh, folks that might be affected. And somewhere along the spectrum, uh, uh, you'll, depending on if you move from the left to the right, we'll get deeper and deeper and you'll be doing more activities and more work with communities that are more collaborative. Um, so when I usually come in and I'm doing an Indigenous knowledge, oh, I, I just noticed someone, Leslie, Leslie Yellowhammer's raising a hand. Let me just see here. Uh, Leslie, I'm just trying to see if you have a question here. And I can't see it. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll save your question to the end, Leslie, and we'll we'll have a quick. Uh, maybe maybe I'll answer your question in the presentation, and uh, if not, then uh, we'd love to have a couple your convers uh, your question at the end. Um, so you know, when I come into a community, it's often about uh, you know meeting the community where they're at, and uh, and the idea is is to really get an. Uh, you know, uh, um, 
interest from the community, uh, meeting them where they're at. It should be led by the community. Oftentimes we have leadership and members engaged in, in the presentations. Uh, and oftentimes uh, in order to get that buy-in, we need to create specific and measurable outcomes. Um, so some of, the, some of the work that we do is, uh, a lot of our work is actually linking our, our research project to actually decision-making and getting that leadership and community support. And using an integrated approach, we often are grooming and identifying uh, community champions and taking a step-based approach to get the work done. Um, uh, we develop a human resources and training plan. Uh, we build a talent within the community. We often hire multiple people to work with us and, and train them on the entire process of what we're trying to uh, do. So that way, when we leave, there's that institutional knowledge that's left at the community. Um, so when we host a meeting, we often are, are introducing a project and we come in and say, Here, here's who we are. And uh, we have to, uh, one of the most important things is following cultural protocols. Uh, establishing those ground rules for engagement, and oftentimes adopting a, uh, an official confidentiality agreement. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of earning consent from participants through the studies. Uh, and then when we do our engagement work, it's often involving all aspects of the community. So we're talking to youth, children, elder, adults, elders, men and women, uh, and we're getting a, we're trying to get a good representation of that community uh, knowledge. Um, and uh, turning those goals into action. So it's one thing to say, we'd love to see this, but it's another thing that says, well, here's how we're gonna go and, and get these things done. Um, when we do our work, uh, it's often, we great, do this great research and we think, okay, I, I hope we hit the mark, but we didn't never know. So what we always do is we do a verification process where we bring all of that information back and say, here's what we heard, here's how we packaged it up, did we get it right? What do we need to do to fix it? And so uh, it's a great opportunity for us to do that course correction before we finalize the work. And then I talked a little bit about earning consent. Well, there's this concept called free prior and informed consent or FPIC. And uh, the idea is, is that uh, the consent is given for free. Uh, it's uh, in advance of any uh, activities. Uh, the engagement is uh, um, seeking consent and also part of an ongoing consent process and that uh, the collective decision made by the rights holders is reached through a decision, uh, customary decision-making process of the community. So who has the right to ethic? Well, all peoples have the right to self-determination. This is a fundamental principle of international law. Um, but under ethic, there's a number of uh, instruments that have been developed by uh, UNDRIP, uh, the United Nations um, uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, the International Labor Organization Convention uh, 169, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and many others, as well as national laws. And so when we think about ethnic and Indigenous Peoples, um, it, for, for us, it allows us to, to give or withhold consent to a project that may affect our territories. And it allows us to be able to withdraw from any processes at any stage. Um, and ASPIC enables Indigenous peoples to negotiate under conditions in which the project will be designed, implemented, and monitored, and evaluated. It's not just not a process of earning consent, but it's uh, giving us an ability to be able to conduct our own independent uh, and collective discussions and decision making processes. So when we apply ethic in the community process of, of and especially when we're talking about indigenous knowledge, it's explaining the who, what, where, where, when, why, and how the research is being captured. We use confidentiality protocols. Uh, we plan for data management and we back up our information uh, using secure backups. So I've kind of framed why maps are important. I've talked about indigenous peoples, I've talked about uh, engagement processes, but let's actually dive in and, and talk about, now that I've framed that uh, in the conversation, we can now talk about, well, what is Indigenous knowledge? Well, according to the United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO for short, uh, local and Indigenous knowledge refers to the understanding, skills, and philosophies developed by societies with long histories of interaction with their natural surroundings. Uh, this knowledge is integral to uh, a cultural complex uh, that is all, that also encompasses language, systems of classification, resource use practices, social interactions, ritual, and spirituality. And that's a really important one, the ritual and spirituality elements. 
and uh, and and it's a unique way of knowing uh, about our our, our uh, cultural diversity. And so I, I I thought, well, how do we represent that? When there's a number of ways you can talk about indigenous knowledge, and I just think that there it, it encompasses this and more. That indigenous knowledge is adaptive. Uh, uh, and, and in order for culture to thrive, uh, adaptation is absolutely required. And uh, it's cumulative. So a cumulative in that, uh, that uh, uh, it's that cumulative knowledge of that, the, um, that, that, that's acquired in a community and many people hold that, that knowledge. Uh, it's intergenerational and in that it gets passed down from one generation to the next. And that can go back, you know, several, like, many, 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 many uh, generations. Um, it's geographically centric in that we're talking about a particular area and people's knowledge about that place is actually uh, uh, intrinsic to their understanding of the world. It's temporarily dynamic in that over time it does change. And it goes, kind of goes back to that adaptation piece. And if we lose it, it's irreplaceable uh, um, because uh, we'll never get it back if we lose it. Uh, and, and and the knowledge is interconnected with other with all aspects of our lives. It's not just it's not just looking at it and saying, well, here's a plant and here's here's the the intrinsic value of the plant. It's about how does that plant service all of our lives in a, in a way that meets all those different needs. That's talking about social, economic, environmental, and spiritual elements of our lives. So when you think about it, that's not, you know these are some but not all of the definitions of indigenous knowledge. When we when we talk about and now I want to contrast that now when we talk about Western science, um, we're talking about uh, um, different ways in which uh, which you might uh, uh, use for indicators for map quality. And so this is adapted from a book called Living Proof by Terry Tobias, and he talked about the idea of being able to look at it from a scientific perspective of map data. So if you go and do an interview and you collect information from the community. Um, was it objective uh, in terms of what you know? How was bias managed in the process? Is it reliable in, in that you, we applied the research methods consistently? Um, was it valid uh, in terms of the information being representative of each interviewee's uh, knowledge and what they were intending? Is it precise in that uh, the the data that was drawn on those maps were they marked properly? And accuracy and precision are two different things in that. Um, uh, accuracy talks more about whether or not they were actually drawn in the correct location on the earth. Um, the integrity of the data, can it be traced back to the informant or the knowledge holder? Auditability, does, can, can you determine if the study is transparent and accountable? Can, if you were to redo the process, uh, would you be come up with similar results? And representativeness uh, speaks to the idea of uh, if the research findings are inclusive of the entire community or a smaller sample of the community. So when we think about uh, that knowledge and, and, and doing these studies, this is one way in which science can be integrated with traditional knowledge. And Terry talks about this idea of, uh, of data diamonds, um, the who, uh, for, so for every map point that you put on a map or every feature that you represent, can you represent the who, what, where, and when of those, uh, each of those values? So we've been doing this for a long time and we realized actually there's other data quality metrics that if, if you are looking at it through an uh, indigenous lens, you're actually talking about the relational aspect of those sites and you're thinking about the ecological elements of those sites and the kinship ties to that place and the intergenerational knowledge transfer that happens, that indigenous knowledge transfer from, from elders to young people. Um, and we felt that uh, a, a data star is more appropriate uh, to be able to represent indigenous knowledge when we're talking about this. And we talked about this in a, in a paper that we put out called Mapping the Digital Terrain Towards Indigenous Geographic Information and Spatial Data Quality Indicators for Indigenous Knowledge and Traditional Land Use Data Collection. So that was, it was in the Cartographic Journal a few years ago. So we've had a long history of uh, doing paper mapping. And uh, this is an example. This is actually my wife doing a study up in Northern Alberta um, where we would roll out these big maps and draw on those maps. And then someone like me as a cartographer would then unroll those maps that were, you know, I, I would receive a box like this of maps and then I'd have to recreate that. And we just found that the whole post-processing effort 
in, uh, introduce a whole bunch of error or the potential for error. It was it, it took it was time consuming. Uh, you know, many of these processes are working fast. So waiting, someone waiting for me to digitize all those maps, it, it was a really uh, uh, onerous process. So we thought, well, how do we still get at capturing Indigenous knowledge, but in a streamlined way? And so we pioneered at what we call a directed digital mapping method. And so we use uh, a laptop, uh, we project the map image up onto the wall, there's laser pointers and, and the data is captured directly right on computer. Now we use Google Earth as our base map because, well, it's got beautiful imagery uh, and we can augment that with uh, our own data layers on top of that. And what do we map? Well, we sit down with the community and we go through a workshop. And we understand what the community priorities and interests are and we'll, 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 uh, we'll workshop all of those ideas and write them all out. And, uh, and really what we're doing is we're mapping the things that matter most to that community. So the activities that they do, the spiritual uh, elements of those activities, uh, where those places are, who they understand, they tell us who we should be talking to, who are the knowledge holders. And we go about um, uh, capturing that. And this is an example of one of our, our community researchers on the right, where uh, she was, she, we trained her to be, be the mapper and we trained her to be one of the researchers. And this is one of her maps that she produced at the end. And so our approach really focuses on documenting indigenous values. So we're trying to get at what the value is. We're not trying to quantify the number of those values. We're trying to get at why those values are there. And so what makes those places so important? And, and so we talk about that intergenerational knowledge. We talk about the connections to the land We talk and waters. We talk about the ability to feed our families. And so uh, for us, it's more about the value. What, what, what is the value of those, of those activities? Not the show me where it is or, or who was there. It's more like, why, why is that place so important? And so when we think about documenting community knowledge from a scientific perspective, there's a whole bunch of terms that have been used over time. So I'll just quickly go through some of the terms. TK is traditional knowledge, traditional use study, use and occupancy mapping, Aboriginal interests and use studies, traditional land use, Aboriginal traditional knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge management systems. And so they, however way you package it up or, or describe it, basically they all have a common root and that it's a systematic and evidence-based approach to capturing that Indigenous knowledge and describing the rights of interest in the, uh, of a community. And how we would, how we might uh, tell the community as well, it's kind of like painting a picture of how and why the land and waters are important to you. So these are some of the indigenous knowledge research products that might come out of a study. So we might do a use and occupancy. Show me where you go hunt and fish and trap and, and where do you go camp on the land? Or we might say, okay, let's do a harvest study. Well, when you go hunting and fishing, how much do you need to feed your family and your community? What kind of resources are you collecting? And how much do you need to, for that to be able to carry on into the future? Uh, we might do a place name study or a toponym study where we're saying, okay, well, how do you describe the landscape? How would you uh, re, uh, remap some of those places that now have colonized names? Um, we might do an indigenous knowledge or a traditional ecological knowledge study where we're talking about the importance of those systems that would support that way of life. So for example, um, we might talk about, well, what makes this area so unique for certain animals or habitats? Uh, what makes that river so unique for, for, for fish to be able to spawn in it? What are those uh, intrinsic elements that will support that way of life? We might do a customary and traditional law study where we're talking about well, how do people manage those resources? Well, who, are the, who are the traditional uh, rights holders and how do you actually define that within some sort of uh, land management system? So integrating those traditional laws and how people make decisions about uh, other people accessing territory. We might also do uh, uh, ethnography where we're looking at um, the written history and the archaeology and pulling all the, all the research that other people, uh, scholars in the past and or tra uh, travelers that have come into our, our backyards and written about us. We might pull that together and get that perspective of that written knowledge. Or we might do a genealogy study where we're, we're understanding uh, who are our family members and how are they connected to these places. And more recently, we've been doing a lot of work around alienation studies. So where did people used to go, but they can't go anymore because of 
a fence being put up or a gate blocking the road or, or a, a no trespassing signs out on the landscape. So there's a number of ways that we could do that. There's a number of best practices. Uh, there's, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, there's Living Proof and Chief Carey's Moose. Uh, but you know, we haven't been, we've been mapping for a long time and doing this research. It dates back probably before 1976. But one of the most, uh, one of the most important studies was the Inuit land use occupancy study, where they actually systematized that process and how we, how we capture that information. Um, so why is it so important that community uh, uh, that the communities are in the driver's seat? Well, we think that it's communities that are going to be able to protect and implement those treaty rights, it's communities that are going to be able to resolve those conflicts between competing uses. It's communities that will help enhance certainty for industrial developers and government. We think community can protect the lands and waters and, and their own backyards, and they can enhance the benefits of the development and also contain the negative impacts of those developments in their backyards. And we think that community member use can be protected uh, and, uh, and that the ability to access those areas uh, should, be, uh, should be identified and, and uh, be able to support those needs of the future generation. And, and I think communities will also be able to steer development toward appropriate locations and contain those negative impacts. And so some of the things that we think about in terms of mapping is, is that, especially or in capturing indigenous knowledge is that maps are not neutral, they're passive tools of communication. And when we do these maps and we draw these lines, they're creating boundaries for unbounded cultural practices. And that knowledge and use mapping priorities is a focus on access to resources rather, rather than an access to territory. So I'm gonna quickly, I'm just conscious of the time, I'm gonna quickly go through some examples of where we've created indigenous knowledge in Western science uh, and intertwining that knowledge. So here's an example where uh, there was four First Nations uh, up in Northern British Columbia dealing with the hydroelectric dam. Uh, and, and they really wanted to at least communicate to uh, the proponent, the government that were making those decisions on why those places were so important. So we went through an exercise of documenting those community values and talking about those places and why each of those places were so important to the First Nations and really painting a picture of, of, uh, uh, of what potentially the impacts could be to those that way of life. So here's an example. These are just examples of some of the maps that might come out of the research uh, that we do where we're taking that traditional knowledge and, and communicating that to uh, government and industry. Uh, similar with the same project, uh, the West Moberly First Nations were uh, going to court uh, with BC Hydro about the Site C dam project. And so using that information, we were able to identify these, these critical areas of cultural, social, and ecological importance, where we were mapping that information, uh, taking that information and, and looking at the patterns, being able to say, okay, these, these, this area is particularly important for these particular reasons. And so these maps actually formed uh, the basis of their arguments in court proceedings. Um, we actually do a lot of our work going out into the bush and, and with, with participants and community members where they're saying, okay, well, here's what the types of resources that we're using and here's where we might collect them. And so we're capturing that using mobile ma mapping tools and being able to capture that in a way that's systematic. So being able to integrate that knowledge with the scientific tools for capturing that. Uh, here, this is an example where we were taking that indigenous knowledge of the Comox First Nation, uh, and they they uh, wanted to they, well they, they wanted to preserve the sea asparagus in their territory, and they were worried about you know how the, how certain activities might impact that. So we went through an exercise where uh, we are using drone imagery. So we were taking the knowledge of where you could find that uh, that those sea asparagus. And we're doing uh, surveys of those places to better understand, you know, wh where they're situated. And then we flew a bunch of drones up and down the coast. And then using that imagery, we were able to classify that, Im that uh, imagery. And we were able to then um, project out what the total biomass of the sea asparagus is for those sites. And uh, this uh, helped us to be able to identify, using a model to be able to identify those sites where uh, the average biomass was uh, located. So uh, this became a really important uh, project to, for the community to say, well, here's, here's what we know about it. How do we visualize that? And it was a really easy way to do that using drones. Um, 
in northern Alberta, we were working with community dealing, uh, that was affected by the lowering of the water from uh, from uh, the tar sands. And so if you know anything about oil sands mining, they basically use uh, four gallons of water for every, sorry, four barrels of water for every one barrel of oil. So you can imagine they go through a lot of water and they just take it freely out of the river. And so we actually did a study with the communities where um, we were understanding those points of navigation along that river. And, and the results of that uh, um, meant that we were able to come up with uh, uh, two different understandings of those water levels. There's a Aboriginal base flow, which, which allows the community to freely travel up and down the rivers without being uh, infringed or, uh, or, or impaired by you know, sandbars or hitting rocks or anything like that because of low water levels. And then there's the extreme flow, uh, the Aboriginal extreme flow, um, which we said, well, this is the, the, at this point, if you go below this, you're now impacting Aboriginal treaty rights because now, you know, those tributaries that flow into the river are now drying up and people can't access the territory. And we use this knowledge and this, um, this information from elders and, and land users, water users, and captured like those points of, of impact. And uh, so then the community also went through a, a scientific based monitoring program where they were then able to confirm the same levels that we had identified six years earlier through the indigenous knowledge study. So this is an example where you're taking those two different knowledge sets and blending them. And they're both saying the same thing, except, uh, you know, um, yeah, they're saying the same thing. Um, another way that we're blending uh, indigenous knowledge and science is on maps is through uh, community atlases. So we're putting together um, these uh, atlases of, of territory and understanding and integrating that traditional knowledge and integrating the scientific data and being able to look at the relationship of those two various uh, elements. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, the outcomes are actually quite, uh, quite amazing. And uh, oftentimes those atlases feed into land use planning. So a community takes that indigenous knowledge and they feed it into a planning process and they look at uh, what the priorities are for their uh, vision and goals in the future. And they can articulate that in a way that helps with, uh, with the community telling developers or telling government, this is how we expect our, our territories to be managed. And on this map here in the middle, you can see the green areas are areas where uh, there's certain resource activities that are can, can take place. And the orange areas are where you need special management and the red areas are those no-go zones. So it helps to communicate those priorities to the external agencies that might wanna go into those areas. And what it does is it opens the door for that dialogue to take place. Another example where we've integrated traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge with science is that we did a caribou study uh, um, with the David Suzuki Foundation and the Doig River First Nation, um, where we were trying to better understand uh, the caribou in those areas. And so this study uh, using uh, the research that we did, we were able to capture those cultural rules surrounding hunting, the seasonal important habitats and the impact on those habitats. And so using maps, we were able to identify these places. And the real uh, important thing about this is that it affected decision-making. So we identified 14 uh, management recommendations for the province of British Columbia to uh, implement in order to be able to protect those resources. And that was based on that foundational knowledge of, of the Dwight River First Nation. So this is an example where you're capturing it, you're visualizing it, you're describing it, and you're saying, here's a plan of how to, how to manage it. So just some final thoughts, and, um, and then maybe we'll open the floor for some questions. But uh, when we're doing our knowledge, traditional or indigenous knowledge studies, uh, we collect a whole bunch of information. And it's really important to stay organized using a consistent project file structure. Uh, and uh, we document the process by taking detailed project notes, we back up our data, we produce a, what we call a data dictionary, and that's something that describes all of the data information that's captured. And uh, we kind of tell people, if you can imagine, maybe maybe uh, someone who isn't connected to the project needs to find something, will they be able to find it? And will they be able to understand the uh, file they're viewing? So just making sure that you're making that clear for everyone. 
What happens with these study results? Well, oftentimes with Indigenous communities, it's about navigating the regulatory regime. It's asserting those Indigenous rights. It's pushing for stronger mitigations that reduces the impact on, on those rights. Uh, many communities are negotiating agreements or litigating or other direct actions. Um, but oftentimes, regardless of those studies uh, from Indigenous peoples, uh, it's the burden of proving our rights is on us. And so why would we let government or companies or industry decide how we're going to be impacted? And I just tell people, you know, grab the bull by its horns and and take control of that process because we don't want other people to make those decisions for us uh so um kind of i love these 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 graphs so uh we talk about comparing levers for indigenous control on the lower end of control is that uh, there might be some access to funding uh it might be there might be some adequate time to do it um deeper level of control means that the indigenous peoples have control over the process and the timelines and the steps that they are taking and required and give directives to proponents and governments and then the highest level of control is control over the outposts and outcomes uh in terms of the findings in terms of condition settings in terms of final decisions and so somewhere along the line we're trying to push for deeper uh, indigenous control and the outcomes of doing good engagement is that indigenous peoples are given a voice by holding the pen i think about the, the cartographer that decided to exclude indigenous peoples from the land of the map and so i want to make sure that i give those pens and uh, let indigenous peoples hold the pen and decide what gets put onto that map build an army define your own process and people will become more engaged on those issues they'll have the information to weigh the pros and cons of any uh, decisions in your territory they'll strengthen your legal position uh, and strong data will, may result in large benefits uh, with developers. And uh, at the end of the day, increased collaboration between indigenous groups, industrial developers, and government uh, is a win-win-win situation. Um, if you want to learn more about the mapping I've talked about, uh, we're hosting an event called the Indigenous Mapping Workshop. It's happening from November 1st to 5th. It's going to be a virtual event. Um, so if you want to go to indigenousmaps.com, and you can register uh, for our mapping collective. It's a free event uh, if you're an indigenous person. Uh, and so we'd love to see you uh, at uh, IMW uh, Turtle Island. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, if you have any questions, and if I'm not able to answer your questions in the next 15 minutes, uh, feel free to email me at steve at firelight.ca or if you, my phone number is there. Um, with that, I am going to uh, I know I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, maybe we can have a chat or uh, answer some questions. Well, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, wow, what a you did say that you were going to give it to us, and you did. <laughs> so, so miigwech, brother, and uh, open the tanka for that great presentation. And um, let me uh, let me say that we have we have some questions. Well, first question maybe is kind of easy: is uh, are you willing to share your slides that you just presented? Uh, yeah, I can share that with you. Absolutely. Okay. All right. And then we have another question from S Sophie Gilbert. She says, I'd love to hear about your experience with folks being willing to share knowledge in terms of knowledge held within families, not widely shared across the community, i.e. root field locations, et cetera, and concerns about current and future data security. Um, well, I think, uh, Sophie, it's a really great question. Uh, oftentimes, it's uh, everything about the community engagement, what slides I talked about is really important, setting the stage, making sure people have the information uh, about your project, understanding how that information is going to be used, how it's going to be collected, how it's going to be shared or not shared, uh, and presenting all of those uh, questions that the community might have before you even go out and ask people about your and so if you can do that initial groundwork and spend that time to really build that relationship and 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 and, and produce that free prior and informed consent and then you know and then and when we're actually going up and talking about these things i i often tell people well i i'm going to ask you a number of questions it's totally up to you to decide whether or not you want to answer them whatever you feel comfortable sharing and that's what we'll, we'll share and if you want to just share it and you don't want me to capture it that's also fine but putting community those community members and those knowledge holders in the driver's seat they're the ones deciding what can be shared and what can't be shared and then and it's my job to be able to um if if they've hired me to capture it then it's my job to capture that information in a really good way um, but also making sure that people know that it's going to be protected and this is the, the protocol and 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 just making sure that that's available for everybody 
And that message needs to communicate, be communicated, not to that person, but everyone involved in the study. So it's about figuring out what that, systematizing that process, understanding how you're gonna communicate that in a consistent way across the board. Thank you, Steve. We have another question from Julia. She says, you mentioned having a strong file management system. What systems would you recommend? A strong bio management system? Uh, file. Yeah. File. Oh, file management. Yeah. Bio management. I, Sorry about that. Thank you. I thought you said bio management. <laughs> that I, one too. That one too. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> file management. So I say keep it simple and uh, don't buy anything crazy. Um, uh, you know, on your computer, you can create a filing system with folders and, and be consistent. So we have, we usually have about 50 projects that are ongoing at any one time. And so we use a very consistent filing process and we make sure that, you know, that it's consistent across the board. So if we have one person working on this project and they get pulled off to another project, the, it's the same file management system that we use. So um, we use open source tools or, or, mm -hmm. or commonly used tools. We use Excel for a lot of things. We use mm -hmm. like Word, we describe things, uh, uh, but just being consistent with your file structure uh, on your computer and back it up. So make mm -hmm. sure that it's on your laptop, but also on a hard portable hard drive or on a, a remote server, making sure that you have it in three different places. Well, we got this. Yeah, G, let's, we're going, we'll go into geology now, Steve. Okay. Um, a question from Jen Spirowitz. Spirowitz says, Miigwech, Steve. So that's a good start. Uh, when geological history and indigenous knowledge don't match, what is the path forward? For example, a geological record shows Western forests and mega fires had have or occurred over every 50 to 100 years versus there were no mega fires because First Nations did not control burns. Or did control burns. Oh, or I did control burns, yeah. Excuse yeah. Me. Well, you know, I'm just trying to show examples of where we were able to blend uh, indigenous knowledge in Western science. And and really, I think uh, in some cases that works, in other cases it doesn't. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I would say if they don't match, that's okay too, right? Yeah. Uh, and those two different knowledge systems will talk about those things in different ways. And so uh, um, I, I think the path forward is to acknowledge and respect that they're two different knowledge systems mm -hmm. and uh, they might come up with di a different perspective and that's okay. Yeah, well, that's a great answer. I appreciate that. You know, Steve, uh, Firelight seems to be doing a lot of different things, uh, the Firelight Group, your company. And I know I saw a question from a graduate student who talked about uh, getting experience or knowledge, working with Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous people. Um, what are your thoughts on how we um, maybe work with or prepare both the Indigenous graduate student or educator or student, as well as a non-Indigenous student? Is Firelight, um, does Firelight have those opportunities or how would you uh, approach maybe um, advising or guiding a graduate student who wants to get involved uh, with Indigenous people and their knowledges? Yeah, I um, I remember when I was young uh, and <laughs> getting started in this field not too long ago. <laughs> You're a pretty young guy. Uh, but I, I remember I would surround myself with people that were working in this field and every I seek out those people and I would want to make sure that I was, uh, you know, uh, if I was at a conference, mm -hmm. sit beside the person that's doing this work or, mm -hmm. or try and uh, be uh, doing volunteer work. And, and so I always tried to surround myself with people that are already in this field and, and, and maybe some of that knowledge may be imparted to me. So um, mm -hmm. at Firelight, uh, that, that carries strong. And so we have an internship program where we, okay. uh, we hire interns, young uh, professionals. And we want to build an indigenous workforce within our own company. So we we have a uh, we invest in the interns at our company. We it's their paid internships, and we nice. expose you to all the different types of work that I talked about. So not just indigenous knowledge, but all every all of our business areas and kind of where you land and what what are your interests. That's kind of what we want to be able to support. And so. Mm -hmm. Um, we make that investment in our interns and with the hopes that maybe they'll become uh, a researcher with us in the future. So, um, so if you're interested, reach out to me, Steve at firelight.ca. And uh, if you're interested in an internship, uh, we have some remote internships right now. So some people oh. are doing it remotely. Um, we live in a remote uh, thing. So a lot of our staff are, we have about 
60 people on our team and they're scattered all across the country. And so, wow. um, that's yeah. cool. That's great, Steve. That's a great answer. I know, um, uh, I know, uh, you're, um, you guys are doing a lot of work and I know that, um, that's important. Wow. I got this pick this, uh, this question here, uh, you see it, Steve, it says, uh, there's a lot of recent research regarding problems with Western science and fire history. Are you seeing that question in the chat, Steve? Uh, rather oh, than read chat. it, yeah, rather than read oh. it, I'm wondering if you might want to just look at that quickly here. Um, maybe we got okay, time for maybe one more question and answer here. Uh, it's a lot there, I'm sure here. So there's a lot of recent recent research regarding uh, problems with Western science and fire history and trying to detect the influence of indigenous burning. We have a paper that discusses this about be released but in the meantime i would suggest okay great thank you so much for this uh sharing this resource i think that's really great jonathan i think it was more of a statement there james more statement okay well i was trying to stump you steve but it sounds like you're unstumpable i have all the answers <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, I'm gonna ask the right you answer i don't know <laughs> <laughs> whenever you get indigenous people together you never know where you're gonna get steve i had one more question i know we're up time here 10 55 mountain time and i I respect your time as well, but I know that you've been putting a lot of effort in this indigenous mapping collective, and I think that's great. And uh, you know, working around the world, I know you do that. Um, you know, is there a is there a role for um, non-indigenous people that, to be part of those workshops again? Maybe you can share a little bit more about that, so they can, you know, grow in their understanding of how you do this work uh, based on what you just shared with us today. Like the Turtle yeah, Island, absolutely. Turtle Island one. Is there points for them to sit in or observe or? or things like that. Yeah, so when we first started out doing those indigenous mapping workshops, we really wanted to create a safe space for indigenous people to come together to talk about these issues, to learn about these technologies and be able to um, create like a network of uh, indigenous mappers. My, my vision for the collective is building a global uh, uh, network of indigenous mappers. So the idea was is creating a space um, for people to come together and we've run a number of in-person workshops uh, and events over the over the years and last year due to the pandemic we had to be creative and so we did a virtual mm -hmm. event uh, we opened it up we said well um, we're going to cr uh, have this collective so if you want to become part of the collective you can sign up for the collective like mm -hmm. I said earlier it's free for indigenous peoples but if you're an academic there's a fee if you work for government there's a fee there if you're a consultant there's a fee um, but then once you're part of the collective, you can come to this event. And last year we had over 850 people apply from, wow. uh, 35 countries around the globe. And, uh, and, and it was a pretty well attended event. And, uh, the idea is, is that we want to expose people to the various tools they might use for mapping and capturing that traditional knowledge or working within the, this space, uh, with indigenous people. So, um, our partners include Google, Esri, Mapbox. NASA, mm -hmm. the Canadian Space Agency, uh, as well as uh, our, we have a good number of community partners, including the Geo-Indigenous Alliance, uh, the First Nations Development Institute, the First Nations University of Canada, the Culture of Conservancy, and a number of other organizations. So um, what we're trying to do is create a space to be able to talk about how people are applying these technologies. And then we teach people, okay, well, if you want to do this, here's how you go about doing it. And here's mm -hmm. a suite of tools that you might use to do that work. Um, we're software agnostic, but if you want to come and learn and maybe you want to apply a tool, well, you can come into these workshops and, uh, and learn how to do that. So go to indigenousmaps.com uh, and it'll take you to the collective uh, uh, and you can sign up for the collective. And once you're in the collective, you can, uh, you can register for the event. And then uh, if you'd like to help guide this kind of programming that we're doing for during the event, uh, fill out the survey. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what, what you'd like to see uh, uh, us do some training on. Well, that's great, Steve. Thank you. I know in the comments and in the chat, you're getting a lot of uh, kudos. And um, thank you. And I really enjoy your presentation. So I also want to close, Steve, by close uh, our, our time together to say miigwech to you, my, my friend and brother. Uh, um, really good stuff that you're sharing with us. And again, uh, to Steve's point, uh, you know, join the collective, uh, take a look at his work. We'll share the slides. And uh, we look forward to, I look forward to working with you as well down the line with the, with the, Turtle, with the Turtle Island workshop. And again, if those that on the audience want to partner with Steve, you know, follow up with him for sure. So with that, Steve, um, miigwech again, brother, and good, good, good talk, good time together. And uh, Jonathan, would you um, 
um, share the next slide with me before we close. So we have our next presentation will be on September 24th. Again, I'm staying north. I love the people of the north. So we have a doctoral student, Anita Lafferty, who's gonna talk about our connection to earth and sky. And we look forward to that. We welcome you and hopefully you'll come. And also don't forget, we're starting a, a survey for these tech section webinars. So um, please uh, take the time. Uh, I don't have a prize for you uh, if you do it, but maybe, uh, <laughs> But in any event, um, we hope that you help us uh, so that we can get the kind of speakers that will help advance this uh, understanding of TEK, help the society again grow its understanding of who we are as Indigenous people, and then also create opportunities for collaboration. So Steve, you did that for us, and we appreciate that. And again, you guys have a good day. Ho hecha tu pelo, so be it. Midakuya oyasi. This closes all my relations. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Chini everyone.